go in the battle section skill. <laughs> it's pretty easy. So. All right, y'all, we're standing to get started. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. And so, Lord, this morning as we begin 2021, 
Lord, we give you ourselves. We lift our voices to the throne of grace for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. All right, just uh, thank did everybody get their communion elements this morning. I'm looking at the table. I, um, I thank everybody did. If you didn't, um, just slip out at some point and grab some out there as, um, as you came in the doors this morning. Well, let's stand. Let's worship again.
is that we pray for one another. Um, and that is, in fact, I believe that, um, that in many ways that is the most important thing that we do when we gather together. And so this morning I want you just to look around here in the fellowship hall and I want you to just pick two or three people, okay, that you are not kin to, okay, that you are not related to, all right? So just look around, pick anybody in here, and while we pray this morning, I'm going to have you pray silently for, the, for those individuals. Okay? Um, this morning, one of the um, passages in the Bible, when we pray for one another, I'm going to be honest, many times this is how I pray. Lord, protect them. Right? That's, that's good. That's good. Um, keep them healthy. Right? That, that's good. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a really really good thing. Many times I'll pray, God bless them. You know what I mean? But if somebody asks me, well, what do I mean by that? Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what I would say. I want to draw your attention to a passage from Ephesians chapter 3 um, that has been on my heart a lot lately. In fact, for the last couple of months, that when I pray for people, um, this is how I've been praying. And when I pray for you, this is how I've been praying. And so I'm going to begin, and this is how I want you to pray this morning for those individuals that you picked out. Okay? Um, and I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Okay? Um, it's a dangerous prayer. But it's a powerful prayer. It's how the Apostle Paul prayed for the believers in a Greek city of Ephesus. Okay? He didn't just ask that God would bless them or that God would protect them. This is how we pray. And I'm going to begin with Ephesians chapter 3, um, beginning with verse 16. Okay? And this is how we pray. Will you bow with me? And I'm going to kind of lead you in this prayer as you pray for one another. Okay? And when I pause, this is how I want you to pray for those people by now. Okay? Here we go. I've got, I don't know how this is going to go, but I pray that you will take this. And I pray that the word of life that is found in the pages of your word, the well, Lord will take our prayer life to another level. And for every person in this room, that as we pray for them in the word, through the words of Scripture, Lord God, we pray that these words will become real in their life. All right, here we go. I pray that name them. That out of your glorious riches, that these people will be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in their inner being. So that Christ may dwell in.
their hearts through faith. And I pray that being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Lord, I pray that we'll be able to grasp how, how wide and long and high and deep is your love. And that will know this love that surpasses knowledge. And that may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father God, for each of these individuals, for every single person who is here in this room, this morning, take us deep. Draw us close to you. Lord, we do pray that you'll protect us, but at the same time, Lord God, make us dangerous so that others will come to know your grace and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. How many of y'all have ever taken a selfie? You know, you know with, with smartphones, selfies, are really pretty easy. I mean, uh, I, I looked on Instagram yesterday morning and I saw a bunch of selfies on Instagram. I, I saw somebody at a wedding um, with um, that and taking a selfie. I saw somebody else sitting at the dinner table. I saw somebody else with the selfie. Um, Sitting there, um, sitting there with a plate of food in front of them. I saw somebody with a selfie in their car. I don't, they shouldn't have been doing that, but they took a selfie, I think, while they were driving. And, and you know, all these selfies, you know, I'm told that you can even use a self timer on your smartphone so it doesn't even look like a selfie. Um, and you know, and then with a click or two of a button, you can post it on social media for all the world or at least your friends to be able to see on social media. Now there's nothing wrong with selfies. And selfies give us a little glimpse of what's important to us or who is important to us or where we are or or all of those things, you know. Um, the selfie gives you a glimpse of who a person is and what they value. So here's my question. If Jesus took a selfie, what would it look like? What would it look like? I mean, would he have blue eyes? Would he, would he be white, black, Hispanic, Asian? Maybe Middle Eastern. What do you look like John Legend in Jesus Christ Superstar? I mean, I don't, I don't know. What would Jesus look like if he took a selfie? Well, with that in mind, I'm beginning a new sermon series this morning. And I'm calling it The Sacred Selfie. And during this series, we're going to take a look at seven statements that Jesus made that are found in the Gospel of John. They 
are oftentimes referred to as the I am statements in the Gospel of John. Now this is a follow-up to a series that I preached last fall on the names of God. And when Jesus chose to describe himself in the Gospel of John, this is how he did it. And if Jesus was going to post a selfie on his Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or whatever um, method that you want to use, Twitter or whatever, this is how I believe Jesus would post a selfie. Um, you know, there are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Now, when Jesus said, I am, and then he filled in the blank, I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection and the life, or I am the bread of life, whatever it was, people got all bent out of shape because they believed that when Jesus said those statements that he was making a claim to be God. Well, he was. He was making that claim because that was who he was. When Jesus said, I am, and then you can fill in the blank, he was making a claim to be God. It went all the way back to the book of Exodus, where we looked at this passage back in our sermon series last fall on, that I called What's in a Name? When God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, and and um, and God just um, named Himself, and He said, "I am who I am." So the two-word phrase "I am" is a claim to being God. And so when Jesus said that um, I am the way and the truth and the life or I am the gate for the sheep, or I am the resurrection of the life, or I am the bread of life, which is what we're going to take a look at this morning. He was making a claim to be God. Now, before I read this passage, um, if you have your Bibles open, you can kind of thumb back in, um, in John chapter 6. Um, John 6 is not a short chapter in Scripture. It is a long chapter. It begins with Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. With the one, the, a miracle that finds its way into all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus fed those 5,000. It was 5,000 men. It didn't count the women. didn't count the children. And so it may have been 15, 20,000 people. We don't know exactly how many. But we do know this. He fed them from a little boy's lunch that was five little barley loaves of bread and two small fish. Now, after he um, fed them, fed those 5,000, they gathered up the leftover food and it filled 12 baskets. Soon after that, the disciples got in the boat and started sailing across the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says that Jesus went up to a mountainside by himself. In the middle of the night, a storm came up on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was up there on the mountain. The disciples were having a time out there in the sea, and so Jesus, that was when Jesus comes walking to the disciples, walking to them on the water. They got kind of scared, but Jesus said, don't worry about it. He climbed in the boat. Immediately the wind died down. And then, just like that, they arrived on the other side. At a place called Capernaum. The next morning, the people that Jesus had fed the day before, out of that little boy's lunch, 
They got up and they were probably thinking in their mind, you know what? Hey, he fed us once and he feed us again. And so they went looking for Jesus, but they couldn't find him. So they went to the other side of the lake, to the Sea of Galilee, to a place called Capernaum. And it was there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that Jesus posted his first selfie in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. But let's read it in John chapter 6, beginning with verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get him? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, what, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. And so they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What, what will you do? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness. And as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Mm. You know, I like this passage. Because it talks about food and I like to eat. Kelly likes to say that, um, that most people eat to live. But I live to eat. And there is a special place that is, has been reserved in my stomach for bread. Because I really like bread. I like Wheat bread, I like rye bread. I like white bread. I like sourdough. I like yeast rolls. I like buttermilk biscuits. I like banana nut bread. You know, there is very, there, I don't know that there's any kind of bread that I don't like because it tastes good. Now, here in our Western affluent culture, bread is kind of a taste good tack on to an already full plate. Some that they go without bread. They turn bread down, maybe because it's high in calories and, and high in carbs and maybe they're on a diet or whatever, but they don't go without eating bread. You see, here in our culture, bread is, is an add-on. It's, it's something that most of us could have, but if we go without, our plate is still going to be full, and we're still going um, to do fine um, with our food. In the Mediterranean world that Jesus lived in, it wasn't that way. Bread 
was an essential part of their diet. In fact, back then in Jesus' day, if you had bread and water, you had a meal. If you had bread, water, and a little bit of wine, you had a good meal. If you would add a slice of cheese and a little bit of meat, like fish or chicken or something else, you had a really good meal. You see, bread was an absolutely essential part of the diet. And so when Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, he is not saying that I'm something that you can add on to an already full plate. He is saying, I am absolutely essential to your daily diet. Um, and that's different than the way most of us think of bread today. I think of bread as being that, um, that especially that bread that's fresh out of the oven that you smother in butter. You know, that I think of that as being something that tastes good rather than something that is absolutely essential to my well-being. But in the Mediterranean world that Jesus was in, it wasn't merely something that tasted good. It was absolutely essential. Jesus was not talking about butterhorn rolls from the bakery. He was talking about what is essential to life. Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus had spoken about bread. Um, back in Matthew chapter 4, when after Jesus had fasted and prayed in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, for 40 days, the tutor came to him and, um, and asked and told them, he said, if you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus responded in this way. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That true life comes from the word of God. The bread of life. Now, in this passage, in John 6, Jesus is referring to two kinds of bread. First is the bread that spoils. Now, bread that spoils was um, a very real um, and a very known picture in the world of Jesus. You see, they didn't have refrigeration. In fact, I'm told over there in Israel, even today, that bakeries will bake fresh bread every morning. Um, and in Jesus' day, they didn't have preservatives to add to the bread to make it last. They didn't have modern refrigeration. So I want you to imagine something with it. You know, Jesus was all about object lessons. Um, have you ever noticed that in Scripture? And that in this passage, this is one of them. I am the bread of God. He said later, he said, I am the gate for the sheep. And, and I mean, he would use fish as an object lesson. He would use all of this. You remember back when Jesus fed the 5,000. After they had this phenomenal miracle, they gathered up 12 basketfuls of food, right? I wonder, what did they do with those 12 baskets? You know, Scripture doesn't tell us. I mean, maybe they spread them out on the ground to feed the birds. I, I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what if 
Just what if? I'm not saying this is what happened. But what if Jesus took one of those basketfuls of bread with them to the other side of the lake, to Capernaum? And what if Jesus showed them that bread as an example of the bread that spoils? What if Jesus was using that as an object lesson of the bread that I fed you with only lasts temporarily. Now again, I don't know and I'm not claiming that that's what happened. I'm just saying I wouldn't put that past Jesus. I'm not, I'm just saying that I'm on the one hand, I can picture Jesus having a basket of moldy bread and then saying that I'm the bread of life. That this bread is temporary. You see, the bread that spoils is good bread. It gives you strength for the day, but it doesn't give you strength for tomorrow. It's the bread that satisfies your taste for right now. That fills your stomach for right now. But tomorrow you need more bread. I, I don't know. I've just been kind of meditating on, on that possibility this week. You may disagree. That's fine. And you're probably not. Okay? But what if? What if? You know, have you ever made homemade bread and then left it out on the counter overnight rather than putting it in the refrigerator? It didn't take long before it started growing mold, did it? Because the same chemical processes that enable yeast to ferment will cause it to spoil and cause it to rot. Yesterday's bread doesn't meet your dietary needs for today. Now, the people that have experienced that amazing miracle. They went to Capernaum looking for more of that bread. But Jesus said, I've got something even better. Even better. Now, they couldn't fathom it. And so they, they, they drew back on their biblical knowledge and started thinking about Moses and their ancestors and and how they, how God had provided them bread in the wilderness in the form of manna for 40 days. And Jesus said, but, yeah, but they had to go out every day and get good bread. It met, provided daily strength. But Jesus said there is another kind of bread. And I am the bread of life. You see, there is the bread that spoils. And there is the bread that lasts. The bread that spoils is temporary. It will help you out for a time. But the bread of life will last for eternity. The bread that spoils will meet your physical hunger, but the bread of life will meet your spiritual hunger. The bread of, that, of, that spoils will mold and rot, but the bread of life will last forever. You see, Jesus spoke a lot about life 
Um, John 14, he said, and we're going to see this in a couple of weeks, but Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. In John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In the New Testament, there are two words for life. One is bios. Bios um, describes life from conception when life begins, from the point of conception to the point of your death is bios. Okay? We get the English word biography from it, right? Describing a person's life from conception to death. Okay? But then there is another word that describes life. And that word is zoe. And zoe describes the quality of life. That Jesus came, came to give you the quality of life. Not merely just being able to live and breathe in your 60, 70, 80 years, whatever, here on this planet. But the quality of life. Life more than living and dying. More than just merely living and breathing, but life like no other. And Jesus said, I am the bread of that kind of life, that that kind of life is found in me. So I think it's very appropriate as we begin another year to begin with the bread of life. Um, not merely trying to go from one day to the next, but eternal sustenance. The bread of life that will satisfy not only your body, but your mind your heart. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, I want to invite you to go ahead and prepare your, your communion elements as we receive these together. Um, and as you Prepare those. Let me um, read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay? We read these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I wonder, when Jesus said those words, I wonder if the mind of his disciples went back to a place called Capernaum when Jesus first said that I am the bread of life. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. And then the next verse 
it says this. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone, which literally means everyone, ought to examine these things before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment. On yourselves. So I want to invite you to take a moment and just bow in prayer and examine yourselves. Confess your sin. Lord, prepare us to receive the bread of life and the new cup in your life. Amen. Jesus took bread and broke it. He passed it around to the disciples and he said, Take it. Will you eat of the bread? Then he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave thanks so He said, This is the cup of the new cup in my life. Pour it out for you and for me. For the forgiveness of sins, will you drink of the cup? Let's stay here. Father God, thank you for this sacrament of your love. Thank you for the bread of life. Thank that you never lost, never lost. And thank you for giving that to us in the person of your Son. Lord God, let us feast on you not only today, but throughout this new year. And Lord, give us the strength that we need to be your body, uh, to be your love, uh, so that others will come to know you in Christ's name. Amen. Go with it. Yeah, 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 yeah